This is a reading from The Mystical City of God, The Conception, Volume 1 of 4, by a Venerable Mary of Agrida. The Mystical City of God, Divine History and Life of the Virgin Mother of God, Manifested to Mary of Agrida for the Encouragement of Men. Volume 1, The Conception. Picture. Mary of Agrita is known to have been favored with the miracle of bilocation. Always remaining in her convent at Agrida, she was, for a number of years, the first messenger of the true faith sent by God to the Indians in Arizona and New Mexico, which were to become states of the United States of America. The mystical city of God, the divine history and life of the Virgin Mother of God, our Queen and Our Lady, Most Holy Mary, expiatrix of the fault of Eve and mediatrix of grace, the miracle of his omnipotence and the abyss of his grace. Manifested in these later ages by that lady to her handmaid, Sister Mary of Jesus, also known as Mary of Agrida, superioress of the convent of the Immaculate Conception of the town of Agrida, of the province of Burgos in Spain, under obedience to the regular observance of the seraphic father, St. Francis, for new enlightenment of the world, for rejoicing of the Catholic Church and encouragement of men. Translated from the original authorized Spanish edition by Fiscar Marizon, Reverend George J. Blatter, begun on the Feast of the Assumption, 1902. Imprimatur. Santa Fe, New Mexico, February 9, 1949. I gladly give my imprimatur as of today to the new edition of the work, The City of God by Sister Mary of Jesus, to be re reprinted from the original authorized Spanish edition of the year in 1902, without change and already bearing the imprimatur of His Excellency, Most Reverend H. J. Alerding, Bishop of Fort Wayne. Edwin V. Byrne, D.D., Archbishop of Santa Fe. Copyright 1914 by Reverend George J. Blatter. Thanks goes to John for providing me with the copies of the uh, book. Special notice to the reader. Revelations. Nothing that essentially differs from the teachings of the Catholic Church can rightfully be taught or believed by any man or under any pretext. Moreover, even the essential doctrines can be taught and expanded only in the sense and spirit approved, or at least not disapproved, by the Church. This at once will establish the position in which private revelations, whether coming from heaven or originating from hallucination, merely human or devilish, hold in the Church of God. There can be no doubt that God can and does manifest to chosen souls hidden things in addition to what he teaches through the public ministry of his Church. It is also an accepted truth that he sometimes reveals them to his friends for the express purpose of communicating this extra knowledge to other well-disposed persons through the natural and human means at the disposal of those receiving his revelations. These manifestations he invariably surrounds with enough evidence to satisfy all the requirements of a cautious and well-founded human belief. It follows naturally that whenever he thus surrounds private revelations with evidences of their heavenly origins, he will be pleased with a rational and loving belief and dissatisfied with a captious and obstinate unbelief of the facts or truths thus privately revealed. Where, however, these external evidences are wanting, or wherever Holy Church intimates the least direct or indirect disapproval, there any faith in private revelation would not only be, be not only foolish, but positively wrong. Full approval. The Church has as yet given no public and full approval to private revelations of any kind, nor will she ever do so, since that would be really an addition to the deposit of faith left by Christ. 
but tacitly and indirectly she has approved many private revelations, and among them the writings of Mary of Agrida. She could well do so, since there are no writings of that kind which exhibit more reliable human proofs of divine origin than the Ciudad de Dios of the Venerable Servant of God, Mary of Jesus of Agrida. The existence of the Bible justifies the query whether there are not other books that have been written under supernatural guidance, though we know, of course, that none of them can ever have the same importance and authenticity as the Bible. For the Bible has provided as the record, for the Bible was provided as the record of the general revelations of God to mankind at all its stages to the end of times. A, fa a vast field between. Evidently, there remains an immense domain of truths outside the range of natural human knowledge and not specially revealed in the Bible. You will at once say, that whole field is covered by the one true religion. Of course it is. The teaching and ministry of men is specially appointed for that purpose, the practice and example of those eminent in the Christian virtues, the writings of those versed in higher truths are ordinary means of spreading truth and leading men to their great destiny. But besides all this, history pro proves that God, for special purposes, often grants to his friends higher insights into supernatural truths and facts, which, if at his command they are recorded in writing, are intended by him as an additional source of higher knowledge and well deserve to be considered as private revelations. Earmarks of Deceit Past ages simply teem with writings that claim to be de derived from or based on divine revelation or inspiration. Many of them are clearly nothing but frauds, showing the signs of conscious or unconscious hallucination. Many, again, seem beyond mere natural human powers of insight, but at the same time, in their authorship and tendencies, show nothing divine or beneficent, thus proving that besides human error and malice, the sinister and treacherous knowledge of malign spirits often finds its way into such writings. Ancient sorcery and magic and modern spiritism have their root in this sort of preternatural communication to be closely scrutinized. Hence, it would be foolish not to demand the closest inquiry into anything put forward as private revelation. Fortunately, it is easy to apply sure and unfailing tests. All that is necessary is to ascertain the character and motives of the writer and the result or drift of his writings. Mahomet proves himself an epileptic adventurer and his Koran a travesty of Judaism and Christianity, settling like a blight upon civilization. Joseph Smith and his companions turn out to be rebellious incendiaries and murderers, and their Book of Mormon a ridiculous fake, establishing a fanatic and bigamous theocracy. The fake Dawi, the fakir Dawi pretending prophecy ends as a lunatic in a bankrupt Zion, yet leading millions to his relatives. The humbugging Eddie, after crazy quilting scraps from the Bible with shreds of, shreds of Buddhism, Brahmanism, and theosophy, shuffles off her wrinkled coil amid a numerous following of dupes who rather expected her fake science to keep her perpetually alive or raise her up from the dead. Is there any difficulty in discovering the fraud in revelations, revelations of such a kind? Yet, they claim divine inspiration, and very often contain passages which show sources of information and deceit not altogether human. The sinister, the sinister manifestation of spiritism and the astounding information often furnished, furnished by mediums are not all sleight of hand or illusions of the senses. Some of these things can be explained only by assuming interference of a sinister spirit world. Really, another argument for private revelations. Would it not be absurd to concede the communication with evil spirits or departed souls, damned or otherwise, and all reasonable people concede it, and deny the possibility of communing with the good spirits or souls and with God, who would want to who would want to limit the power of God in this way? It will not do to claim that all the communications of God 
and the good spirits takes the ordinary course provided in the public ministry of the true religion, for it does not. St. Paul saw things that he dared not reveal, though he was not slow in writing down his other revelations. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception and the infallibility was privately revealed many times before they were officially defined and accepted as self-understood truths by all reasonable men. Before these doctrines were defined, who had the greater prudence and insight? Those people who refused to believe these truths because they were privately re revealed, or those who examined those revelations and finding them humanly credible and not contrary to the true religion, simply accepted them as revealed by God? I should think the latter showed themselves ahead of their times and far more enlightened in their belief than the former, who persisted in a finical unbelief concerning all private revelations. No difficulty to distinguish the true from the false. If we find that the author of alleged private revelations has been a faithful adherent of one of the true religions established by God, of the one true religion established by God, that he has led a good and blameless life, that his writings do not run counter to the Bible nor to the public teachings of the true church, that he was not actuated by motives of selfish gain, pecuniary or otherwise, that the writings themselves tend towards the practice of perfection, both as far as the writer as well as the reader is concerned, that they have not been openly disapproved by the church, then certainly, if the information recorded is such that it would presuppose supernatural inspiration or direct communication with the higher world, we are not justified in immediately rejecting the writings as fraudulent. Closer examination may easily lead to reasonable certainty that they are privately revealed. But we all know that this acceptance can never mean anything more than a mere human belief, not the belief of faith, such as, for instance, is demanded by Holy Scripture. In fact, as soon as any such writing lays claim to implicit faith, it certainly is no revelation and ought to be rejected at once as spurious. Mary of Agrida. She was the daughter of Francis Coronel and Catherine of Arana, born April the 2nd, 1602, in the small town of Agrida, near Tarazona in Spain. In 1617, she entered the convent of the discalced Franciscan nuns in the convent of the Immaculate Conception of in Agrida, and took her vows one year later. In 1625, she was chosen abbess, much against her wishes, and except during a short intermission, was re-elected every three years until she died in 1665. The fame of her prudence and foresight, not only in the government of her convent, but in other matters, soon spread outside the convent walls, and persons of the highest rank in state and church were eager to obtain her counsel in important affairs. The King Philip IV visited her, visited her several times in her convent and corresponded with her about national affairs for many years, but she was no less famous for her exalted virtues. In many respects, her life was a faithful copy of that of St. Francis. The miracle of bilocation related of her is in fact more remarkable and lasted a longer time than that recorded anywhere in the lives of the saints. Her good sense, her truthfulness, her sincerity, her humility, her unselfish love of God and man eminently adapted to her for the communication of messages from God to men. What induced her to write? In all writings that lay claim to private revelation, the motives of the writer must be closely scrutinized. If it appears to be a self-imposed task for selfish ends, pecuniary or otherwise, tending to particularly in religious tending to particularity in religious teachings or practice not approved by the established faith or written without knowledge or consultation of the rightful superiors, it ought to be rejected as spurious. God will reveal nothing for such purpose or under such circumstances, and he will permit human error and deceit and the sinister influence of hell to run their natural course. Nothing of all this appears in the writings of Mary of Agrida. Though she was urged interiorly and exteriorly to record the facts of history revealed to her concerning the Mother of God, she resisted for twelve years and was finally induced to write only through the positive commands of her superiors. 
Reluctantly, she began her history in the year 19, 1637 and finished it in the year 1645, continually asking to be relieved from the task because she thought herself unworthy. As soon as the insistence of her superiors relaxed and an error of judgment on the part of an outside confessor gave her a plausible excuse, she burned all her writings, thus destroying the labor of many years. When this came to the knowledge of the higher authorities and, and when they insisted on her rewriting the history, which continued to be supernaturally made known to her, she again succeeded in delaying the task for 10 years. Only the strictest command under obedience and the threat of censures finally induced her to write the manuscript, which she began in 1655 and finished in 1665, and which is still preserved in the convent of Agrida. Why revealed to a woman? It is to be remembered that God's almighty power is restricted to no particular instrument. He creates out of nothing. In the case of Balaam, he used not only that wicked man, but even his beast for special revelation. It does, it does seem that he prefers women for private revelation. He chose men to reveal the great public truths of the Bible and to attend to the public teaching. But to women in the new law, he seems to have consigned the task of private revelations. At least most of the known private revelations have been furnished to us by women and not men. We must infer from this that they are better adapted for this work. In fact, no special learning or great natural insight is required of a messenger. Such qualities might tend to corrupt or narrow down the inspired message to mere human proportions, whereas private revelation is given precisely for the purpose of communicating higher truths than can be known or understood naturally. Humility, great piety, and love, deep faith, are the requisites of God's special messengers. Women, as a rule, are more inclined to these virtues than men, and therefore are not so apt to trim the message of God down to their own natural powers of understanding. In choosing women for his special revelations, he gives us to understand from the outset that what he wishes to reveal is above the natural faculties of perception and insight of either man or woman. How was Ciudad received? As soon as the City of God appeared in print, it was welcomed and extolled as a most wonderful work. The different translations found no less enthusiastic welcome in nearly all the European countries. It secured the immediate approbation and encomium of the ordinaries. It secured the immediate approbation and encomium of the ordinaries, the universities, the learned and eminent men of Christendom. There is probably no other book which was so closely scrutinized by those in authority, both civil and religious, and afterwards so signally approved as the City of God. By order of Innocent XI, Alexander VIII, Clement IX, Benedict XIII, and Benedict XIV, it was repeatedly subjected to the closest scrutiny and declared authentic, worthy of devout perusal, and free from error. The title Venerabilis was conferred upon the author. A large-sized volume would be required to record the praises and commendations written in favor of the great city of God. Opposition. As the city of God so strangely maintains the prerogatives of the mother of God and the authority of the popes, it was not to be expected that it should escape the malicious slander and intrigues of those tainted with Jansenism and Gallicanism. Many members of the Sorbonne in Paris were secret or open adherers of these sects at the time when the Ciudad was first published in French about the year 1678. The first translation in French was very inexact and contained many interpolations and false versions of the original. Dr. Louis Elias Dupin, and Dr. I. De of the Sorbonne made this translation in the foundation, made this translation the foundation of virulent attacks. Dupin was called by Pope Clement XI, Nequioris Doctrine Ominem, a man of pernicious doctrines. He De turned out to be a rabid and fanatical Jansenist, cut off from the church as a heretic. 
as they and other members of the Sorbonne succeeded in enlisting the sympathy of influential Gallican courtiers and church dignitaries, both in Paris and at Rome, they secured a clandestine prohibition of the City of God, which appeared in the acts of the Congregation of the Office. When it was discovered, no one could be found who would dare stand sponsor for it, and immediately Pope Innocent XI, on November the 9th, 1681, annulled the act, positively decreeing that the city of God be freely spread among the clergy and laity. The very fact that this prohibition did not issue from the Index Commission, but from a department not concerned with the examination of books, proves that it owes its insertion to Gallican intrigue, secretly extending even to high circles in Rome and to the fair-minded. This sectarian attempt will be a convincing argument for the excellence and orthodoxy of the doctrines contained in the Revelations of Mary of Agrida. Many editions. The popularity and excellence of the great history of the Mother of God is also evidenced by its widespread diffusion. It has appeared in over 60 editions in Spanish, Italian, French, Portuguese, German, Latin, Arabic, Greek, and Polish. Does it seem providential that the first English translation of this great work should have been reserved for our own times? No other language no other language on the face of the earth is the medium of so many theories, sects, and isms as the English language, and the city of God is a most timely, efficient antidote for the epidemic of false doctrine which is sweeping over all the earth, and it affects especially the English speaking portion of the human race. Expectations of the translator. The translator and promoter of the city of God is confident that it will not be one of the books idly filling the shelves of libraries, but one which at the first cursory inspection will arouse the desire of further inquiry and lead to repeated and attentive perusal. The translation herewith offered is as exact and as perfect a rendition of the original Spanish into English as ten years of assiduous labor and a considerable experience in literary productions give a right to expect. The subject matter surely ought to secure it for a proper place in the more elevated ranks of English literature. May this first English translation, under the guidance of our holy faith, bring forth abundant fruits of the Spirit among English-speaking people in all parts of the world. Feast of the Annunciation, 1912, Fiskar Marison, South Chicago. Letter from Archbishop Bertone. Bertone. The Archbishop is now Tarsicio Cardinal Bertone, SDP, and Archbishop, as Archbishop Bertone, he became Secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 1995. He became a Cardinal in 2003 and was appointed Vatican Secretary of State on September 15, 2006. Congregatio Pro Doctrina Fidei, February 7, 1998. Dear Miss Lester, the congregation writes in reply to your fax of October 29, 1997, in which you asked if there are currently any restrictions on keeping or reading the mystical city of God by Venerable Maria of Agrida. Please be assured that at the present time there is no condemnation or restriction issued by ecclesiastical authorities with regard to this book. With kind regards and prayerful best wishes, I remain sincerely yours in Christ. Tarcisio Bertone. And here is the page so that you can see for yourself.